20th century Chicago, the city that was built by business leaders who were sharpshooters, land speculators, those people whose streets you traveled through in the city of Chicago, many of them, when their time came, believe me, the up button wasn't automatic. Uh, these individuals gave up their power reluctantly to this new phenomenon, a democratic Catholic Chicago. And who would do the lead? Everyone thought it would be the Irish. It took a long time for that to happen, even into the 20th century. Why is it? Very simple fact. The process of becoming acceptable, except for African Americans, and to some degree Jewish Americans, took longer for the Irish than any other group. Just took longer. Uh, there's a book that was published where I wrote all this out many years ago to uh, some rave reviews and some rave criticism. <laughs> Nevertheless, he goes on. What happened? The untold stories is very, it, to me, is simply a shifting of demographics. The flow of Protestant Republicans <coughs> out of the city and filling in behind them Catholics, mainly Irish Catholics. This community was restricted to Irish Catholics. Some of you know that. This community, a little north of here, but still this community, had one of the largest KKK rallies in the history of America. We weren't, for, we weren't protesting blacks and Jews, they were protesting Catholics. They moved out. You want to see where this change took place? Start counting all the congregational churches in Oak Park and Evanston. And you will see who filled in. And people were moved. People from prominent families in this community were moved from other parts of the city to organize this new territory. The wild and woolly community of Beverly, even giving this ward the number 19, was a slap in the face. Because when they redistricted, 19 was probably the worst number you could get. That was the ward in the basically would be known as Taylor Street today, where people were being machine gunned, where Johnny Powers was doing in Jane Addams. They named the tollway after Jane Addams. She never beat Johnny Powers. It should be called the Johnny Powers tollway. Uh, so this process started to take shape in the 1920s. And what you then had by 1930 was a changing electorate. It wasn't that the water changed. It wasn't that some <laughs> miracle happened. The people who voted in the, in the city were different. And wars which used to create incredible large, and I mean large, Republican votes turned Democratic. We don't have time to go into all the details, that's my position, and I'm sticking to it. But that was a combination led by Southsiders, who happened to be Catholic, and happened to be Irish, and Westsiders, who happened to be Jewish. They took over the city of Chicago. And as some of my friends say, have never let go. <laughs> so what you have then, is that you have a changing demographic, a changing religion, and so when Richard J. Daley became mayor in 1955, he basically reflected all the pain and agony of what it took to get to the top. Though there were Irish mayors before him, they really weren't Irish mayors. He represented the community and all the pain and all the aggravation and all the slights. In the book, The Mayors, I write about this, again, with uh, <clears throat> mixed admiration. Religion has diminished in recent years. This city has changed so much in the last 20 years, it, it's breathtaking. And despite all the changes, despite all of the turmoil that we've had, Chicago-style politics still remains a mystery to most of the nation, if not the world. It has remained at its core an energetic force driving the city forward. Beneath it, underpin a moralistic good that has allowed the vast majority of its citizens the opportunity to find a better life for both them and their family. The morality behind all I have said and more than I could have said is relatively simple. No matter who or how the city was governed, wave after wave of immigrants found their way to Chicago. No city has had a larger number of more of different ethnic 
racial group than the city of Chicago. It just is, you know, more Poles except for Warsaw, more Czechs except for Prague. You could go down the list, all living, at least at one time, in the city of Chicago. They came to Chicago to live, to work, to worship, to play, and to raise families. No city has ever had so many different ethnicities and races come in such numbers into its boundaries. Governance was often not pretty. Believe me, I was at the county board Monday. Not pretty, or fair, or always honest, but it reflected the hard-nosed aspirations of its citizens. No city in America, or for that matter, the world, or perhaps the universe, loves its local politics more than Chicago. And the rough-and-tumble political scene has matched the rough-and-tumble personality in business, labor, and, yes, religion. Harold Washington once remarked about Chicago politics, it's like Cracker Jacks. Once you start, you can't stop. <laughs> so national critics, especially those from east of the Hudson River, or even suburbanites who are journalists writing about Chicago, who thumb their nose at the city and how it's governed, or maybe what I've said tonight, I would challenge them. I defy any of them, or anyone in this audience, to tell or show me what big city filled with our level of demographic diversity, and that diversity does not hide behind exclusionary zoning laws, yes, there's some of you upscale suburbanites, <coughs> has delivered more for its citizens. And that is the moral perspective of Chicago government. Warts and all. Its battle cry from 1837 remains the same. The city works. And as long as it works, and a majority of people think it works, they will put up with the bad. They may put up with the ugly. But as long as the city thrives, the city keeps winning. We're not talking sports here. The, kitty, the, the city keeps winning. This city's uniqueness will remain unchallenged. And I think that's the message I wanted to bring tonight. And through it all, when you look at it, and I end with this, when I was a grad student, we were talking about it with Sister Sue and others before, and talking about my day at University of Chicago, I remember some of it. My old professor, Dick Wade, who had the misfortune to come from Monette, from Monette. <laughs> but he gave me the best line, which has been repeated over and over and over again. What's the difference between Democrats and Republicans in Chicago? The answer is relatively simple. Republicans divide the city into wards. The Democrats divide the city into parishes. <laughs> and as long as you understand that simple fact, you understand the dynamic. Can that dynamic continue? I'm getting fairly long in the tooth. Normally I'd say yes, but the way the city is changing, I'm not so sure. This is like the movie The Blob. The yuppies are everywhere. They keep oozing out in the different neighborhoods. How can they be stopped? Uh, perhaps the tax on uh, 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 a bottle of water could be the start. <laughs> but... The city of neighborhoods is now becoming the city of upscale condos and townhouses. And you have young people living in the city who think they're in Denver without the mountains. Uh, it, is a, it, is, it is a changing city. And who knows what the future will bring. But my guess is as long as that uh, fellow, what's his name, Daly, is uh, mayor, uh, this city will continue this tradition, though it's not going to be as strong as it was. 10, 20, 30, certainly not when his dad took over. But that's the power of the city of Chicago. Local more important than state or national. That to me is different than any place I've ever read about or ever researched.